Today I want to look at the notion of the superfactorial and do two nice problems involving the superfactorial. But I guess before we get to what we will call the superfactorial, I'd like to point out that there are several different notions of this object. We're going to deal with one. So the superfactorial we will use, which will be denoted by SF of n, is n factorial times n minus 1 factorial times n minus 2 factorial all the way down 2 factorial times 1 factorial. So this seems like a reasonable object to call the superfactorial. Now the first thing that we're going to do talks about how large the superfactorial is and its growth. And we want to determine the limit as n goes to infinity of n to the n over the superfactorial of n. And maybe before I do this, I'd like to note the following kind of well-known limit. We won't prove this, but um, you can find a proof of this fairly easily. And that is the limit as n goes to infinity of n to the n over the normal factorial is infinite. So what we'd like to determine is, well, does the superfactorial grow more closely to the growth of the factorial or this n to the n function? Okay, so let's get to it. So here we've got this limit as n approaches infinity. We have our n to the n over SFn. Let's observe that this limit most definitely will be bigger than or equal to zero. We know that that's going to be bigger than or equal to zero because all of the terms of the limit here are positive. Now let's maybe apply the definition of the superfactorial here. So we've got our limit as n goes to infinity. So our n to the n over, so n factorial, n minus 1 factorial, n minus 2 factorial, all the way down, 3 factorial, 2 factorial, 1 factorial. Okay, so now we're going to start doing some sort of inequality argument here. So it's kind of like the squeeze theorem. So what I'd like to observe is I can throw away all of these terms that I'm putting in green parentheses, and what I do is I create something larger, and that's because my denominator is smaller, and if the denominator is smaller, then the object is larger. So this is going to be less than or equal to the limit as n approaches infinity, and now we have n to the n over n factorial times n minus 1 factorial. Okay, nice. And now what we'll use is a well-known formula that we've derived on the channel before and we've used on the channel several times, and that's Sterling's formula. And Sterling's formula allows you to replace a factorial within a limit with something that's sometimes a little bit easier to work with. And in fact, it says that m factorial grows like the square root of 2 times pi times m to the m plus half over e to the m. And what I mean by it grows like this, I mean, well, exactly like I said before, you can replace factorials with things like this within the limit. So let's do that. Re let's replace this n factorial and this n minus 1 factorial with this thing right here. And in fact, I'd like to point out that we kind of had to throw away all of the rest of the terms here because we wanted to ensure that we kept only the terms that were big enough to apply Sterling's formula. Like for instance, three factorial, we wouldn't really apply Sterling's formula. That, that would not be a reasonable thing to do. Okay, so this is gonna now be the limit as n approaches infinity. So our numerator is still the same, n to the n, and now our denominator looks like two times pi from the two square roots of two pi. And then this first term will be n to the n uh, plus half over e to the n times n minus 1 to the n minus half over e to the n minus 1. Really, we have n minus 1 plus half, but that's how it's going to all shake up. Okay, so now let's move some things around here. Let's observe that we can bring an e over 2 pi in front of the whole thing. And then after rewriting, what do we have? Well, we're going to have an n to the n here, and then an e to the 2n, and then in the denominator, we're going to have, let's see, an n to the n plus half, and then an n minus 1 to the n minus half. So something like that. 
But now let's do the following. Let's cancel this n to the n with this n to the n, and this n to the half with this n minus one to the minus half, and that builds another inequality in the correct direction. So we have all of this is less than or equal to e over two pi, and then left over in the end is the limit is n goes to infinity of e to the two n over, now we've got n minus one raised to the n power. But now I'd like to observe that if n is approaching infinity, we can replace the n in the base down here with something kind of as large as we want it to be. So I'd like to replace it with perhaps something like e squared plus two. I can most definitely do that. So this is gonna be less than or equal to e over two times pi. And then we have our limit as n approaches infinity. Our e to the two n is on top and our e squared plus one all raised to the n powers on the bottom. So I'd like to reiterate what we did right here. So let's observe that in this limit right here, almost all of the values of n will give us a value of n minus one to be larger than e squared plus one. So that means for all important values of n, those where n is approaching infinity, we have this e squared plus one is smaller than this n minus one. So if we do that replacement, since it's in the denominator, we end up with something larger. But now let's observe that we can rewrite this as e over two pi, and then we have the limit as n goes to infinity, and now we have e squared over e squared plus one, all raised to the n power. In other words, we're taking the limit as n goes to infinity of a number less than one raised to the n power. But it's well known that limits like that are equal to zero. But let's see what we've done here. We've pinned our goal limit on the left by zero and on the right by zero, meaning that the value of this limit is zero. So I guess we could say instead of what is, we could say that we want to show that this limit is zero. And maybe since we've done that, let's put a check mark next to it and then look at our next problem, which is to find how many zeros are at the end of the superfactorial of 100. Let's notice that that's really asking how many times can 10 divide into the superfactorial of 100. But since there's enough twos, all we really need to know is how many times can five divide into the superfactorial of 100? So let's keep that in mind as we do our calculation. So this is gonna be 100 factorial, 99 factorial, 98 factorial, all the way down, three factorial, two factorial, one factorial. But now I'd like to observe in expanding this out, I have exactly one factor of 100. Well, I guess more if we shuffle things around and combine things, but I mean before we do the combination. So we've got 100. And then notice, let's see, we have two factors of 99, one from the 100 factorial and one from the 99 factorial. And likewise, three factors of 98, four factors of 97. If you get down here to three, Let's see, we're gonna have 98 factors of three, and then 99 factors of two, and 100 factors of one. Okay, but now let's observe that all I really care about here are the multiples of five. So I'm gonna write this with all of the multiples of five kind of separated out from everything else. So that's gonna give me 100 times 95, let's see, that's gonna to be to the sixth power times 90 to the 11th power times 85 to the 16th power times 80 to the 21st power. And now let's get the rest of those on the board. Okay, so that's everything sorted the way that we need it. So we've got 100 times 95 to the six times 90 to the 11, 85 to the 16, and so on and so forth, all the way down five to the 96 power times n, where n represents all of those non-multiples of five. So that means that five does not divide n. So now let's observe that for almost all of these, I can factor out a single power of five. Actually, 
all of them but exactly four, I can factor out two powers of five from 100, and then two powers of five from 25 or 75, two from 50, and then two from 25. And that's obviously because five squared is 25. So let's keep that in mind as we write the following thing. So now this is gonna be five to what power? Well, not thinking about the double factorization, if you will, we pull one power of five out of 100 plus six out of 95 to the six plus 11 out of 90 to the 11 plus 16 out of 85 to the 16 and so on and so forth all the way down to 91 and 96 from 10 and five. But that only represents maybe the single powers of five, we have double powers of five as well. So we multiply that by five to the, let's see, it's one from here, and then it'll be 26 from 75, and then 51 from 50, and then 76 from 25. And then I'm gonna multiply this by M where five does not divide m. And that's where we've taken all of the rest of the stuff and smushed it together with our previous number capital N. Okay, great. And now let's look at this. So now I'm just gonna extract the exponent of five here, and that'll actually be equal to the exact number we want, which is the number of zeros. But in order to do that, I'm gonna do a bit of a trick. Let's observe that there are exactly 20 terms here. So you can count them up, but it's kind of pretty easy to see that there are 20 terms there. So what I wanna do is take one away from all of those, and that's gonna give me 20 plus, and now if I take one away from all of those, I've got five plus 10 plus 15 ending at 95. Then I've got that number down there, but you can simply add those one plus 26 plus 51 plus, and you'll see that you get 154. So now let's see that this number is equal to 174 plus five times one plus two all the way up ending at 19. And I've written it like that because now we've got this well-known uh, triangular number, the 19th triangular number. So now we have 174 plus 5 over 2 times 19 times 20. So the 2 in the denominator and the 19 times 20 come from summing that triangular number. But now it's just a bit of arithmetic and you can see that this is 1,124. Okay, so there you have it. Two kind of nice problems about the superfactorial.